wonderful to see everyone who would be here as we again gather together as Christians are obligated and privileged to do on the first day of the week to do our very best to worship God. It's my privilege to be the speaker on this occasion and I want to present some thoughts this morning from Ezekiel chapter 24. In Ezekiel chapter 24, we find some words there in beginning there with verse 15, where the word of the Lord came unto me, which is how the prophets were given their instruction. Um, this was a miraculous happening. And when you were a prophet chosen by the Lord to deliver his word, you could not help but speak those things that the Lord wanted you to say. Verse 16, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with the stroke, yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. The prophet Ezekiel, as I understand, was a contemporary of Jeremiah and Daniel at the time of the Babylonian exile. While Jeremiah was ministering in Judah, Daniel serving in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar, Ezekiel was preaching to Jewish captives in Babylon. And sometimes we forget that the writers of the Bible were real people, just like us. They had times of sadness and happiness, just like us. They got tired, they got hungry, they got sleepy, they got sick just like us. They lived, they died, they went through all the pangs of humanity, and they didn't get any special breaks, you might say. And the Apostle Peter tells us how these men of old were able to speak on God's behalf. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time to the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the word moved, as I understand it, is a, is a sailing term like the sail has no choice but to move against the wind. And so as the wind blows the sail, so the vessel will go. And while that can be tuned, you might say, if the sail is there and the wind is there, it will be moved. And so it was that when God chose to use someone to speak on his behalf, they were going to speak. I don't think we can begin to understand what it would have been like to speak words against our will. Now we all know our personality and how it expresses itself. Some, some personalities are expressive inwardly. Some personalities are expressive outwardly. And that's a fascinating thing to study for another day. But you notice that in groups and you find that in families where when someone says, let's think about something, there will be one group of people who are just absolutely silent. They're talking inside. And others, when said, let's think about this, immediately start talking because that's how they think. And if you don't understand that in a group, it can cause all kinds of conflicts because those who think out loud, where they start is not at all where they're going to end. And if those who think inwardly tuned out after the first sentence or two, they're going to miss the rest of the story. And it's always fun in a group like that when individuals are thinking for the ones who are quiet to give these dirty looks to the ones who are talking and the ones who are talking to give dirty looks to the ones who are silent. And that's just the way we are. But can you imagine having a force from God that forces you to say things and you don't know what's about to come out of your mouth. At least that's my understanding of how that worked. Neither did they always understand the things they had just said. Remember the Old Testament prophets longed to understand the things they revealed. They weren't given that knowledge. Well, imagine being a prophet of God and being forced to say some things that had to do with your personal life. And that's the situation that we're involved in here. With one stroke, I am going to take away from you the desire of thine eyes, or as other translations say, the delight of your eyes. 
So God is going to use something that's very personal in the life of Ezekiel to teach an amazing lesson to the people of God. You see, Ezekiel, in, ad in addition to being a prophet, was also a married man. And he loved his wife very much. So much so that the Lord called her the desire of his eyes or the delight of his eyes. And so what the Lord is saying to Ezekiel is your wife is about to die. And verse 18 tells us, so I spake unto the people in the morning and at evening my wife died. I believe the Lord was using something that was going to happen to teach this lesson. That's my thought on this particular issue. I don't think God deliberately took the life of Ezekiel's wife, but we are, we are not told that. So I believe the Lord used a, a, an event that was going to happen to teach this important lesson, and we're given an insight into what it was like to live in those days because the natural mourning of that culture is addressed in Ezekiel 24, verse 17. And so uh, this has to do with a turban about his head, and it's saying, keep the turban fastened on your head. So Ezekiel evidently was someone that normally wore a turban. Um, keep your sandals on your feet. So evidently a sign of mourning was to loosen at least the turban, if not remove it, and to wear no shoes. And it says, cover not thy lips. A sign of mourning in those days would have been to cover the lower part of his face and it says, eat not the bread of men. Evidently, there was some common food that was eaten during a time of mourning. And God said to Ezekiel, don't you do that. He also said in the very first part of that verse, don't you cry. Don't you cry. I remember, remember, I, I, I talked last night about those, those uh, wisdom enhancing moments that my father gave me in the form of spankings. And... Uh, I would always cry because it hurt. Uh, now, had, it, had, had I been able to stop him from spanking me from crying, I'd have been, ooh, I'd have been bawling uh, very loudly, but that didn't stop him. So I, I cried from the pain, and after, uh, after a reasonable amount of time, my father no longer wanted to hear me cry. And so he would say to me, it's time to be quiet now, or words to that effect. And have you ever been in the midst of a full cry and tried to stop, it just, it just chokes you up inside. And have you ever had such a fullness in your heart from sorrow that you just can't help but cry? And the Lord told Ezekiel in his greatest hour of sorrow, don't you cry. Don't you do it. How do you like being a prophet? Whew. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And he said, here's what's going to happen. What are we going to do if we have an announcement like that? This is amazing to me that Ezekiel did what he always did. Ezekiel continued his service to God just like always. Tragedy was about to strike and he knew it. Yet he did not abandon God. Now let's think about that. So many times in our lives when tragedy strikes us, whether it's a major or a minor tragedy, we end up blaming God. Remember, God lets life happen. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes that talks about time and chance happening to all. And I, I don't buy this thing when something happens in someone's life of them saying everything happens for a reason. I think time and chance happens to everybody because the Bible says that. I know it's possible to be in the wrong place at the wrong time because the Bible insinuates that with a verse like that. 
It's also possible to be in the right place at the right time. God lets life happen. Now, does he control everything through his creation? Yes, he can, and yes, he does. And even if he directed something to specifically happen in our life, we wouldn't have a clue that that's how it happened. We would not know. But we do know in this case, God said to Ezekiel, here's what's going to happen to you. What are you going to do? Who are you going to be? And so we know that life changes are going to happen to us and happen to our loved ones. And so that question can still be asked of us, who are we going to be? You know, it's wonderful to be a happy Christian when everything is great in our lives, but what about when that changes? Are we going to turn our back on God? That's not what Ezekiel did so long ago. He says, I spake unto the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And he says, I did in the morning as I was commanded. Now those are easy words to read. But you know, sometimes obeying God is the hardest thing we will ever do in our lives. It can be our finest hour, and no one will ever know. These are not things that are trumpeted from the tops of the hills. These are not things that are announced in congregations. These are not things that are spread between friends. These are things that we know in our heart that we're going to do what God wants us to do. And we do it because of our faith in God, not because of the praise of man. And so Ezekiel did everything he was supposed to do, and God wanted to send a message. Here's what had happened. God's people were evil. Their lives were just not pure. Ezekiel 24, verses 13 and 14 says, And thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, or tried to cleanse you, and thou wast not purged. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness anymore, till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not go back, neither will I spare. Neither will I repent. According to thy ways and according to thy doings shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. And so because the lives of God's people were evil, he decided to take away the delight of their eyes, which was the temple of Jerusalem. And in Ezekiel 24, verse 21, speaking of the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth, the object of your affection, in other words, and your sons and your daughters whom you've left behind shall fall to the sword. And so the people held Jerusalem, and particularly the temple, in high regard, but they forgot about God. The temple was not God. The temple was not good service to God. They thought as long as they held the temple in high regard, they were fine. And God wanted them to look up. <laughs> and so we many times get caught up in the things that we make temples. We get caught up in the things of this life and we forget that there is a higher calling for God's people in Christ Jesus. Here's what God said through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, verses 8 through 11, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And that last phrase means the Lord is saying, I'm watching you. I see all of these things, as God, of course, does, seeing our hearts. God's people were maintaining the outward symbols of religion, but they themselves were not people of faith. And by the Lord taking away from them their beloved temple and possession of the city of Jerusalem, he revealed them for what they truly were, evil individuals maintaining a thin skin of religion. <clears throat> I'm sad to say I'm sorry that the same thing is still possible today. I believe it's possible to maintain outward symbols of religion, but to not be people of faith. And so our outward symbols of religion are, outward, are, are absolutely, totally necessary. And don't let me in any way degrade them. 
But whenever we gather together for worship, and that is seen outwardly, our worship is absolutely essential. Those things we do in observing God's plan of salvation, the pattern of New Testament salvation, absolutely necessary. Who we are in our lives with our fellow man regarding how we conduct ourselves, those are absolutely necessary. Our appearance, in our dress, and in our hair, those outwardly seen things, absolutely necessary. But if they're not the reflection of a sincere, pure heart, then we end up just like those people of old where God said, this is, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Because there's more to serving God than just the public functions and those things that are seen outwardly by others. We also need to be individuals of holy lives. And this is the very personal part of our relationship with God. We need to be individuals of holy lives, whether we are here at a time of worship or whether we are by ourselves in situations in our homes, in our jobs, in our schools. And so Job said, uh, Job chapter 24, verses 4 through 6, My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. Job said some amazing things in the midst of some of the greatest adversity that anyone ever knew. And yet he said, I am going to be a person of faithfulness to God. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely. Proverbs 10 and verse 9. And so everywhere we look, we have obligations to be reminded of who we're supposed to be. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Oh, I would that we could just snap our fingers and holiness would be our possession in the greatest degree of maturity that God desires. But I think this verse and its language, when it talks about perfecting holiness in the fear of God, is talking about the journey that we need to take in our pursuit and our desire of holiness before God. And so the pattern that is established by these verses is that we need to do our very best uh, to live before God as he would have us live so that we might have a clear conscience before, uh, before our fellow man and, and especially before God. And so if we are to perfect holiness in the fear of God, I think that leads to some practical things in our lives. You know, it's not just the vertical relationship that establishes who we are with God. It's also those horizontal things that establish how we apply his truths in our lives and in our hearts. And so if we are to perfect holiness in the fear of God, as 2 Corinthians 7, uh, 1 has to say to us, what does that mean? So let me share just a few things that I think we could be reminded of, and this list could be far, far longer. I think it means we pay our taxes. So in our culture, in our land, there is a tax code that no one can understand, <laughs> but we still need to pay our taxes. And we sometimes look around us and say, is it really right for a Christian to pay taxes to a government, whether locally or at a state level or nationally, that is so corrupt in so many ways? Um, yes, it is. That's the right thing to do. And so one of the ways we know that is because um, whenever the Apostle Paul addressed this subject, he was addressing this, this honoring of the government, this honoring of the king to the people at Rome. And if you spend any time studying the structure of the Roman Empire and the honesty and, or the corruptness of the leaders of the Roman Empire, you will discover that there's evil that existed in their lives that our leaders, I don't think, have ever even heard of or thought of. You talk about a corrupt society. Now, our culture is so peaceful. It really is. We change leaders of our nation by people casting a ballot if they choose to. 
There's no command for them to do so. If you want to, help yourself. If you don't, don't. That's a peaceful transition of power. In the Roman Empire, if you were going to be at the top of government at any level, you had to be willing to take advantage of everyone and kill anyone to get there and to be deceitful on the way to the top. That was just the way it was. And remember, this extended into many positions because those who were even in charge of collecting the taxes were presumed to be absolutely, totally corrupt individuals. Matthew, the apostle, was a publican. Now that's not a Republican, that's not a political statement at all. He was a publican, which means he was a tax collector. And there was a presumption that every tax collector was a crook. And every tax collector charged more than he had to and pocketed the difference. That was the presumption with all of those involved in the system. And yet the Lord said to those people, uh, to the Christians who lived among those types of rulers and administrators, pay your taxes. And so we can do no less. And we need to be willing to do that. And no, we don't approve of those things that they do and those values that they have, but that's part of being a good citizen of any nation around the world. And so ours is a spiritual nation intended to exist as peacefully as possible in every nation around the world. And so God's people are instructed according to those ways. If we're going to perfect holiness and the fear of God, it also means we pay our bills. Now, to say we're going to pay our bills is that we're going to do our very best to manage ourselves in an appropriate way with money. That can be so, so difficult. Now, there was a study I read about one time where people were chosen at random and asked the question, how much more money do you need in order for you to be okay financially? And everyone consistently ended up saying about 10% more. And this was individuals who lived at the poverty level and individuals who made hundreds of thousands of dollars. They all said, we need about 10% more. It's not unusual for individuals to say, if I just had a little more, things would be okay money-wise. Now, there can be things that happen to us in life. We can plan and be very diligent in our planning and be very conservative and appropriate in our planning and then something happens in life. An illness happens, a company closes, a job is lost and all of a sudden our circumstances are not what we intended and not what we hoped and prayed would happen. We had planned appropriately but it didn't happen the way we had planned. That's very different than saying, you know, I know the plant's gonna close in three months so I'm gonna go out and get a new car today while I still have the income to put down, but I'm not gonna pay for it. I'm just gonna drive it as long as I can. Well, now that's just being a thief, purposefully being a thief. And so when we pay our bills, we do so on time. If we have the money to pay a bill, we pay the bill. And it shouldn't take late notices for us to write a check or to enter the information online to get our bills paid. Because we want to be people of good reputations. If we presume we live in a small town where the person we're paying is the person we're gonna look in the eye when we go to the store, we'll want to pay them. And if we run a business, we will want to be paid. And so if we run a business and somebody says, uh, can you put that on my account? We can say, yes, because I know you're gonna pay me. And if somebody's a deadbeat, we end up saying, no, I'm not gonna put anything on an account for you because you haven't paid me from the last time we did this. Oh, I'm good for it. Well, go get the money. I'm sorry, it's cash and carry for you. And when a Christian who has the means to pay doesn't pay, that makes everybody look bad. We are to get along and to live well with those especially who are worldly people. Now. Being honest in our relationships with everyone means that we do not steal from our employer, from our neighbor, or from any business. And the slant that I would like to present on this is if we are paid to the hour where we work, then that means the people who pay us are paying for our ability to their tasks. 
They want us to apply our energy to their tasks. If we apply our energy to visiting all the time, then we are robbing from the place where we work. And every place has that. Every company has those water cooler individuals who just won't go get to work. And they don't ever stand in a corner and talk to themselves. They always bother somebody else. So you've got two people not working. And when you have a situation like that, you have productivity that is lost. And if we own the business and we hire people to work for us, we will be reasonable, of course, with breaks and with, with some chit chat along the way. But the idea is we're there to work. We're there to work. And we apply our God-given talents to those tasks, to the glory of God. And we serve a greater and a higher master in our tasks. And so we work for the glory of God so that others will see Jesus in us. And yes, along the way, we will be good workers. We won't be rude about it to those who aren't, but neither will we slack off when they think that is the thing to do. And so we will do our best to be honest in all of our dealings and our lives will of necessity then be different than those others. Now there's a construction company in California that many, many years ago hired Brother Greg Branch from the Oklahoma City area. Many of you know him and know his family. And they hired Greg and allowed him to, to advance to a level of a supervisor and a foreman and and a superintendent on projects and then they allowed Greg the right to start hiring people and so he started bringing in people from the church from that area and that fellow didn't know anything about the church but he he all of a sudden he said uh, Greg you know any more of those Church of Christ boys <laughs> you know any more of those guys because what he had learned is that who Greg brought in they were good workers and they were honest people and he could trust them and his company flourished. It absolutely flourished. And there was a depression that hit California construction about 10 years ago. And while Greg's company has suffered some, they have been among the top individuals able to work through all of that time because of who they are every day when they go to work. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobated. So the concept of self-examination needs to be in all of these other matters. And it was Jesus himself who said in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And James writes in James 1, verse 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so... We need to do our best to say, who am I and who do I want to be in this life? And hopefully we can say there are practical applications for the precepts in God's word. And I hope that we're always looking for how does that apply? It's not just a theoretical truth that I can discuss intellectually. This also is something that I can take to work with me every morning. It's who I am every day. It's who I am at home. And that's how the Word of God lives in our hearts. And it becomes part of who we are. Well, I want to consider the phrase, the delight of your eyes, and what it is that delights our eyes, and, and what I hope should delight our eyes. Now, when something delights our eyes, I think it's more than just a casual acknowledgement. I think it's an excitement, and I think it's a recognition of something that is just amazing and wonderful. And I'll give you an example. When our oldest grandson was just a little toddler, uh, and he would come to stay with us, he uh, really liked the ice cream man. And those are all over the country, you know, and this distinct music starts a block away, and you hear it. And he was not the little fellow that came to us and said, oh, by the way, grandparent, uh, the ice cream man is two blocks away. Do you think it might be possible uh, to invest in a treat for me? That was not his approach. His approach was that his eyes just got huge 
and he started saying, ice cream man. Now he said it in his own way, but that was all. He said, ice cream man. That had all the meaning in the world. It meant get money now because ice cream man. And so we would go digging for change and we would open the door. He would run to the curb. He was ready because it was the ice cream man. And the sight of that ice cream truck and the sound of that music just absolutely delighted his eyes. I hope we have that kind of delightment. Not necessarily with ice cream, although with Bluebell, it's really close for me, just so you know. But what is it that delights our eyes? Like Ezekiel, I think our spouse should delight our eyes. And for those of us who are blessed to be married, to be married, oh, I hope your spouse delights your eyes. For gospel preachers who leave for weeks at a time doing the Lord's business, it takes a very special wife for that to work. And for a preacher to know that everything will be at home, will be okay at home for him while he's gone. But when a preacher goes on a trip like that and comes home, his spouse is just the delight of his eyes. Many of you work and jobs take you away from home, sometimes for days at a time, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you come home and you're able to see your spouse, I hope you're just absolutely delighted at the sight. Cassie has always delighted my eyes. I talk about her when she's not with me a lot easier than it is when, I, when she's here because I cry when she's here. And uh, when we got married, I decided I would sing to her as she came down the aisle. And uh, it was a surprise. She knew I was going to sing to her but didn't know what I was going to sing. And I ended up singing the song, The Wonder of You. And I meant every word of that for her. And I practiced. Now understand that I'd been singing in high school for years. I'd, I'd been singing with my dad and my sister and we'd sang at events of all kinds and competitions. And so singing was, that was not something I worried about doing at all. And so when Cassie turned the corner, she and her dad and stood there for a moment as I was singing it was the first time I'd ever forgotten the tune to a song. And I tell her, she's so beautiful, she took my tune away. <laughs> she was then, and she is now. And if our spouse is not beautiful to us, that's just a tragedy. Because the person that can help us go to heaven the most is the person we say I do to. And I hope we're delighted to see them every time. And when we go away from them, I hope we can hardly wait until we can come home again. Because that's how God intends for us to be in our homes. We have the beautiful obligation of mirroring the relationships in our homes that exist between Christ and the church. And so the husband is in place of Christ in that picture, and the wife is in the place of the church in that picture. And as Christ loved the church, so the husband is to love his wife. As Christ sacrificed for the church, so a man is to sacrifice for his wife. And as the church loves Christ and eagerly awaits his return, to be delighted at his sight. So indeed a wife is to be delighted with her husband. May we be delighted with one another. Benny Cryer, Benny Cryer's mother had been ill for some time and she reached the point mentally where she didn't know any of the family anymore. And one day they showed her a picture of her husband. He'd been dead for many years. And she looked at that picture for a while and then she said, my, what a handsome man. And that's just so sweet to me. Proverbs 5.18 says, Rejoice with the wife of thy youth, 
and that is who we are to be. Our spouse is to delight our eyes. Our children are to delight our eyes. And yes, they can be a lot of work. <laughs> they can be a lot of trouble, but I hope they delight us. Psalms 127 verse 3 says, Lo, children are heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has a quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. There's a special relationship that we have with our children. There's also a special relationship of a different kind that we have with our grandchildren. Having six grandchildren now, I will tell you, I'd much rather have had grandkids first. They're delightful. And then it would have made having the children and raising them and all the work that that entails worthwhile, you see. That's not the way God does this for us. But having a child is an opportunity to present someone to God, to show, to show them to God, to show them the way of serving God. And if they choose to follow that, when they grow up, that is such a delight. But understand, if they choose not to follow that, it's a tremendous heartache. And as great as the delight is for a child that walks in truth, as the Apostle John said, so is the greatness of the heartache when a child does not choose that path. But our children are a delight of our eyes. Our brothers and sisters in Christ should also delight our eyes. It should be so wonderful for us to be able to come together for worship and to see one another and to be with one another, to help one another through the pains and the trials of life, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. After all, 1 Peter 2 verse 17 does say, love the brotherhood. That's who we are to be, brothers and sisters in Christ, who deeply love one another and are delighted to see each other, as we are when we see people we haven't seen for a while. But every time the church gathers together, understand whoever will come, it is a delight to see them. Please don't ever think that if you just decide to stay home, you won't be missed. That is never the case with God's people. We long to see each other. We long to be built up by one another. We long to have the encouragement that we can give and that we can receive from being together as God's people. I also believe that correct worship should delight our eyes. Yes, we do these same things every time we come together. And that is exactly who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do. And yes, we're familiar, like putting on a familiar suit of clothing. We know what this is when we walk through the door. And it should delight us that that is who we are and what we do, because we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are worshiping God in spirit and in truth, according to John 4 and 24. And it should delight our eyes when we know that we are going to worship God in just the way that he wants us to. Also, when someone obeys the gospel, it should delight our eyes. There is, there is no way to express the feeling that we had when we became Christians, is there? You know, we can try, we can write those words, we can describe it, Intellectually, it is a reasonably correct thing to do. We can intellectually say, it is logical that I will obey the gospel. It is logically correct for me to come to the conclusion that I need to obey the gospel as the Bible declares in faith and repentance, confession, and baptism for the remission of my sins. It is logical to do that. But it is also an amazing emotional experience where our heart is filled to bursting with the joy of knowing that we are now forgiven of those sins that haunted us that stood between us in a right relationship with God we know that for ourselves and so whenever someone is baptized we are thrilled for them but also what we're doing is reliving the joy of our salvation and when we see someone buried in baptism for the remission of their sins, 
It is as though we are there once again ourselves. And it's no wonder that we sing, oh, happy day, when these things happen. Because it is such a wonderful, wonderful time when someone obeys the gospel. Because we say there is one more that Satan will not have. There is one more child who is going to live in such a way that they will be in heaven. We will be there together. We don't know what heaven will be like exactly, but we do know it will be wonderful beyond compare. And when we get there with the redeemed, what a delight, what a delight awaits us. And we live every day in anticipation of that delight. Did you notice that when God identified what delighted Ezekiel, it was not wrong. What Ezekiel delighted to see, God approved and God blessed. May we live in such a way that what delights us, God approves and God blesses. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, won't you make this the day that you delight all of heaven by your obedience to the gospel? Because the heavenly host, seeing the obedience of the redeemed, rejoice in anticipation of our being together in heaven. If you're not a Christian, we would love for this to be the day that you obey the gospel. If you are a child of God and you've sinned publicly, won't you make this the day that you repent of that wrong, that we might pray with you that you could be restored to faithfulness. If there's one who will obey the gospel or repent of wrong, won't you please come forward while we stand? While we